Welcome to Windows on the World. I'm Mark Windows. This show brings you cutting edge news, empowering information and no conspiracy theories. We will be watching those who are watching us, watching the people's voice. We will be covering a wide variety of interlinked and fascinating subjects on this and future shows. We want you to be part of the show, so do phone in. The People's Voice has brought geoengineering and the issue of chemtrails to a wider public. We will be updating the work so far on next week's show. This week saw the police state in action against students protesting in London about the corporate takeover and loss of facilities through privatisation and the education system. So we have corporate education, corporate police and corporate government. Since last week's show on due process and the erosion of all our rights through the administrative courts, we have some very interesting information to bring to you in the forthcoming weeks. Please contact us if you have any stories which we may be able to cover in future shows. On today's show, we will be looking into ancient technology. We are all familiar with megalithic sites around the world which have huge stone structures. Many of these, including the pyramids and Baalbek stones, could not have been moved or shaped by even modern technology. The anomalous structures around the world do not fit conventional history. The elongated skulls of Peru and Bolivia and the red-haired giants which have been found all over the world also do not fit conventional evolution theory. The megalithic sites of Britain and its interlicking ley lines also suggest that the sites of our stone circles were not just there for astrological reasons, to chart and celebrate the birth and symbolic death of the sun or astrological alignments. After much research, it now appears that the alignment of ancient stones had as much, if not more, to do with an energy grid and the transformation and control of Earth energy as it did with astrological alignment. Brian Forster has been researching the elongated skull phenomenon and the pre-Inca megalithic sites for a decade. He has been making videos, writing books and arranging tours of ancient megalithic and Inca sites in Peru. This from Brian's site. The Inca are believed to have come from the Tiwanaku area of Lake Titicaca at about 900 AD and settled in Cusco about 200 years later. Conventional academics insist that they founded Cusco and built everything called Inca. However, the glaring variations in construction techniques that we find in what is left of pre-Hispanic Cusco tell a different story. Over the forthcoming weeks, Brian will tell us what he has discovered about the technology used to create these structures and also give an examination of the long head of South America, a bizarre race who often had red hair and were of unknown origin. They had incredible megalithic walls, advanced technology and strange energies that are still present there. Here is our first interview with Brian. Brian, yeah, welcome to Windows on the World. Um, your book, Lost Technology of Peru and Bolivia, talks about this site that you came across particularly. Is that correct? Well, that's true. The thing is that um, on my very first trip to uh, Peru, visiting Inca country, which is, uh, you know, the area around Cusco, I noticed automatically that there were very great differences between so-called Inca constructions. Some of them were very simplistic in terms of field stone being stacked on top of each other with adobe mud. And then next, next to that site, you would have buildings or sections of walls where you have what looked like machine cut stone without any mortar and so precisely um, close to each other that the the stones you you can't even fit a human hair in between and so obviously I saw this as an, an anomaly and through time been able to figure out that the Inca civilization were not capable of some of the buildings and walls that are attributed to them yeah, that's right. I've, I've watched your videos, and and that's you make that point very, very clearly because you look at this um, the megalithic stones, which are huge and, in, and and almost like welded together. Then you go into the Inca stuff, which is not really as good, and then you get to the later Spanish stuff, which is just like compared to the ancient stuff, a complete bodge job, isn't it? Really, it is. And actually, one has to take into account that the first um, masons, etc., that were brought to Peru in the 16th century would not have been the great experts from Spain. I mean, 
people wouldn't have a tendency to want to leave the old world, like Spain, for the new world, unless they were in, you know, reasonably dire straits. And any successful stonemason would probably stay in Spain. So you wouldn't have had the experts um, showing up in Cusco to build the colonial city. And as you stated, the the thing is that the with the Inca work, we see Bronze Age technology. Um, that the Inca had, and that meant that they weren't really able to cut hard stone, so they depended upon the use of clay mortar and roughly shaped stone, uh, stone in order to build most of their constructions. It's, it's kind of anomalous uh, within conventional history, isn't it? Well, definitely, because the thing is that um, most scholars um, and archaeologists, and, uh, archaeologists and historians will basically say that all of Cusco was built by the Inca prior to the arrival of the, the Spanish in the 16th century. Um, but the more that I travel through Cusco, the more that I have guests visiting, the more we're able to see individually and as a group that there are much finer constructions, much older than the Inca period, which would maybe go back a thousand years. Uh, we've had experts such as Robert Schock uh, looking at some of the work and uh, other geologists, and they simply can't figure out how a Bronze Age culture could have been able to move multi-ton blocks and fit them together with such fine precision that, again, you can't fit a human hair in between these stones. Some of these walls are six feet thick, and yet, again, you can't fit a credit card, a piece of paper, or anything like that in between many of the blocks. And also, the dating of a lot of these megalithic structures seems to be very vague as well, doesn't it? Well, it does, and there are parallels between um, Peru, Bolivia, and ancient Egypt, too, because, of course, the Great Pyramids are said to have been built by the dynastic Egyptians, uh, you know, using bronze chisels and stone hammers. The same excuse is given in Peru, because that's what's found in the archaeological record. But the problem is that we've been depending too long, uh, you know, upon archaeologists exclusively and not allowing people like stonemasons, geologists and other experts in different fields to look at that and or at these things and that's what I'm actively engaged in is a multidisciplinary look at these and the more that I have these experts look the more that we are able to um, basically shatter the concept that the Inca were responsible for high-precision technology, which was impossible to a Bronze Age culture such as theirs. In the Inca city of Cusco, this is a very common way that the Inca would build a wall. They would shape the stone and put the stones together, and then they would put adobe mud in between as a mortar. Later, the Spanish arrived, and the Spanish would mix straw and adobe mud, and they would make walls like this, which then they would paint. On the other hand, we have that. And this is what is ascribed to the Inca. However, how in the course of 300 years, do you go from this kind of building to that? Or from that kind of building to this kind? It seems the most logical thing that happened was that this wall existed possibly thousands of years before the Inca existed and they inherited this. Well, thanks, Brian for being on Windows on the World, and look forward to speaking to you very soon. My pleasure, thank you. Researcher and lecturer on intervention theory and curator of the anomalous star child skull, Lloyd Pye, passed away earlier this week. Lloyd's lecture, Everything You Know Is Wrong, and his books on hominids and theory of intervention, including the idea of genetic manipulation of humans, was as detailed as his research on the different types of hominids, the ones who were inhabiting this planet. I spoke to fellow researcher Brian Forster about Lloyd's work and why it will be continued. So when did you start um, working with Lloyd? Um, actually, I contacted Lloyd about two and a half years ago. 
just because I knew he was doing DNA testing of the Star Child skull, and I was I was interested in having the elongated skulls tested. And so he, at first, he was kind of um, apprehensive about you know he kept asking me who I was, etc. But um, over a period of time, we became. Um, you know, quite actually quite close in contact. We contacted each other once a week, and um, uh, his geneticist was sent samples of the elongated skulls, which are being processed. And so we developed quite a, a good online relationship, and we're actually planning on having a tour this coming August because he's uh, he was fascinated by the elongated skulls and hadn't really had a chance to to look at them in person. Yes, I think that's great, Brian, that, that, um, that you two made contact because you're obviously carrying this work forward, and that's great. The important thing is that when he knew he was, <clears throat> was very ill, he passed on the, um, the Star Child to a, a group who are taking care of the ongoing research now. Um, and so I'm also in direct uh, contact with his geneticist who uh, will be uh, doing uh, the DNA testing of the elongated skulls of Peru. So I think the really important thing is that uh, his legacy will continue and expand, um, and it's not going to be a case that um, that he will disappear from the history books. I'm, I'm, I for one will make sure that his legacy becomes stronger uh, because of the access to incredibly uh, modern, high-tech equipment that, that we will be able to utilize. We'll be able to get very good results for a very uh, low cost using the you know the most updated equipment that exists in the united states well that's great and um lloyd was also known for his hominid research which was absolutely groundbreaking in in some ways because he and he came up with something that was highly probable um as, especially with it with his his research into the hominids and the possible genetic modification of Homo sapiens sapiens. Well, very much so. And the thing is, he uh, in his books, he writes um, in a very like good style, so that anybody can understand what it is that his theory covers. It's not like he's um, using too much scientific nomenclature and and, uh, and wording. So I've of course read all of his books and and find his theories not only feasible but uh, probable as well. Indeed, so do I. His lecture, Everything You Know Is Wrong, was one of the best of its kind, I think. Definitely. Mm -hmm. So, in other words, the, the work of Lloyd Pye and his research will live on through people like yourself. And I'd like to thank you for that, Brian, and we'll speak to you very soon on Windows on the World. Absolutely my pleasure, Mark. Thank you very much. Here is part of an exclusive interview I did with Lloyd. There are also some great short introductions to Lloyd's work on the YouTube channel Land of the Free UK. Humans do not fit in the flow chart of life on Earth for 20 million years. We just don't fit. We clearly appear at 200,000 years ago. Our genes say we appear at 200,000 years ago. The Sumerians say they created us at 2,000 years ago, 200,000 years ago. Our genes in our bodies show clearly that we've been genetically engineered. Show clearly that we've been genetically engineered. Again, all things that I deal with in considerable detail. The problem is, if you accept that alien reality is real, this is the problem with mainstream science. As soon as they have to acknowledge UFOs are aliens, or Bigfoot for that matter, this is why they keep all of these things in limbo, in intellectual limbo, by ridicule and ignoring, is that as soon as aliens are real, or Bigfoot is real, or hominoids are real, that means that Darwinian evolution is not true, that humans didn't evolve on Earth. And so we lose that, that special place of, of, that we have in the scheme of things now, just like people used to have a special place in the scheme of things, that Earth was the center of the, of the known universe, we now live with the conceit, the lie, the conceit, that we humans are the center of the biological universe. That's what we have to give up. In the 1500s, they, have to give up, they had to give up their place at the center of everything. Now, we have to do the same thing. We have to give up 
our imagined place as the biological center of the universe. And that's going to be traumatic for a lot of people. But we can't get to the next phase of whatever we're supposed to be developing into until we come to that, to that point of recognition and understanding. And so that's what I work toward. That's what I, I consider my job, or one of my jobs, is to move everybody to that point of understanding and acceptance that we're not alone. And not only are we not alone now, we never have been. And some of those people that share everything with us, share the universe with us, and particularly our galaxy, share our galaxy with us, those individuals, one type of them created us. Another type of them created the whole planet, terraformed the whole planet to be what it is. And they're not the same. The people that created us are very much later than the terraformers. The terraformers started at around four billion years ago, and whoever and whatever they are, they have no concept of time. As we understand time, time is meaningless to them. There is no time. There's no time. If you can look at a seething ball of magma and say that in eh, three or four billion years, we're gonna have this place really shaped up and looking good. In three or four billion years, as we understand time, it means to them, time means nothing, it just means nothing. So that is where I think we are, and that's what I, I push toward and push everyone toward understanding, is that we need to make some profound changes in our understanding of who and what we are if we're going to ever hope to get toward the truth of anything. How do you think the public could react if they found out that they indeed had been genetically modified by a superior race who put them on Earth, who were, who were watching what they were doing, uh, monitoring, and, and basically keeping them in, in a prison. Well, I think when people find it out, when people understand it at the level that I understand it and that others who work in this field understand it, you know, your first feeling is that basically we're not much more sophisticated than lab rats, really. For all that we think we are, to them, we're just like lab rats. But, and, and what I really compare it to is, to them, we are like infants crawling around on the floor with dirty diapers, just oblivious to any and everything that's really true about their environment. We need to move to a point where we get up off our knees, clean our diapers, become like, you know, at least to the level of children going to kindergarten, and I think that we do that by acknowledging that they're there, that, they, okay, we now understand and accept that we did not evolve here, that we are not the end-all, be-all of the universe or the galaxy, that we are just members of a community, of an intergalactic community. We understand that. We accept that. We know you're there. And we're willing to accept our own very, very diminished role in the grand scheme of things. If we get to that point, when we get to that point, I think that is when they will reveal themselves to us and say, okay, now that you're to this point of maturity in your development, we will now begin to help you to move along a little faster. And I think that they will have the technology to end our fuel problems, our dependence on on uh, uh, petrochemicals, that they will be able to help us with some of our disease issues, uh, maybe cancer. They will be able to help us correct some of the 4,000 plus genetic disorders that we have and, and on and on. I, I think in the end, it's going to be a very good thing for humanity as a whole. But in the short term, it's going to be very traumatic, very traumatic for a lot of people to have to acknowledge and admit that everything they believed and they were taught and have defended and fought for was just wrong, was just wasted effort was really in the end just kind of stupid. And so that's going to be a hurdle that a lot of people have to overcome, and I think they will overcome it. But it, it, not until then will we make any real progress toward our actual, real, true future, which is part of a galactic community. And we're not going to get there until we get up off our knees and acknowledge that 
that's the truth, that we are part of a community. They're out there and sort of ask them for help. And I think when we get that mature in our understanding of things, they will they will help us. They will appear and help us. I don't see a bad end for us. I don't see anybody coming down like Independence Day and just blowing us away. I don't see that. I see I see a good ending in the end. Thanks very much, Lloyd. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Stephen Doros is a researcher who has worked as a stonemason whilst looking into telluric energy, the electrical charge running through energy lines around the planet. His experiments give insight into a worldwide energy grid and the way that energy can be channeled through stones. This, of course, ties in with the ley lines, including the St. Michael and Mary line and the Berlinus line. The British Isles have a huge network of standing stones. Some researchers believe that there is a worldwide energy grid which includes the Great Pyramid and megalithic sites around the world. The biggest secret could be free energy. Here is an introduction to telluric energy by Stephen Doros. There's a telluric current line uh, basically running that I've taped out so that everybody can see it. And I can show you Basically, I've put in a square at the moment. There's one, two, three, four rocks in the corners. Okay, so I've basically what I've done is these lines, and I'll show you in a minute in another space in the garden, the average distance. They're normally about eight to ten foot apart, these. But what I've done, and it makes sense as we go through, is I've squashed these lines, uh, five of them, into this square. Uh, so they're now running approximately six foot apart rather than eight to ten foot apart, okay? The central one is the one that I've actually marked out, okay? And what I'm going to do, I'm basically going to walk across from one side to the other and all I'm asking for with the dowsing rods, and we'll explain more about the dowsing rods as well, but uh, all I'm asking for is to, show, to indicate um, where there is a line of telluric current, okay? So as I walk forward, the lines cross, okay? Now I'm now going to ask I mean, which actual way do they flow, okay? And it's in film they flow that direction. I'll carry on walking, and there's another one, and that's flowing to my, well, effectively flowing to my, yeah, to my left. And then there's the next one, which is the one I've taped, which is flowing to my right. The next one is flowing to my left, and the final one is flowing to my right. So there's five lines inside the grid. If I lifted up the cornerstones, these lines are effectively, you can push them and you can move them, which is what I think our ancestors knew how to do. You can push them and move them and put them where you want, but as soon as you effectively release and lift up the stone, literally, physically lift up the stone off the ground, the lines almost spring back to their original locations. The questions that I was asking 18 months ago in regards to this were it's about differing types of rock and how different rocks would have an influence on these telluric currents, how granite would have an influence, how dolerite, which uh, they're both paramagnetic rocks, they're very influenced by magnetic fields, compared to things like uh, a sandstone and limestone, uh, which aren't, unless they're wet, in which case they do become. Uh, so I was asking those questions a year ago. Now, in the process of dotting all the I's and crossing the T's, insofar as how rocks can manipulate these lines, I've now gone back to uh, a very simple questions okay now at the moment i'm i'm just looking at how rocks can move these lines uh, it doesn't matter what sort at the moment um, it's just actually finding out the initial basic um, basically how it works okay the next questions once i've gone through these series uh, will be then moving on to different types of rock and the different influences uh, that that will have but at the moment we're keeping things very simple just to show you um, basically how it all starts So, Stephen Doros, welcome to Windows on the World. Hello, Mark. Thank yeah. you for having me. Great. I mean, I remember when we shot that video, and I, I was very, very drawn to what you were doing when we talked at a festival over the summer, because you described this telluric energy and how you can harness it and, and work with it 
um, and observe it That's right. very, very clearly. Can you tell me about how you got into dowsing and, and looking into this kind of um, technology? Uh, I've always had a, an interest in the, the, the spiritual side of life and I've always um, uh, one of the I read a book when I was a teenager by Alfred Watkins called The Old Straight Track yeah. which was all about ancient ancient what we call ley lines uh, and over the years my interest has, has, has developed I've always visited uh, lots of Neolithic sites um, I decided a few years ago to to make myself a pair of dowsing rods out of literally a coat hanger yeah. you know two bits of coat hanger bent, bent into an L shape and then slowly, um, I had a few friends that were dowsers as well, and I taught myself how to use them. And I started wandering, and I started just walking the lines and seeing, seeing what I could actually find, you know, out there in our fields and on our hills. Uh, and it's, uh, and then the interaction between that uh, and and all the different stones and rocks around the world, and it's. One, one step at a time has, has led me through to sitting here with you today. Well, looking at that video, it's very interesting because you're actually, you're plotting where the telluric lines are. I mean, you, you, you plotted out where they were. And you also have this um, very interesting thing we're going to look at in the second video about rocks being able to take this telluric energy. Um, can you tell us a bit about how you came across that? Telluric currents are basically a very, very low voltage current. They flow over the entire planet um, and they're on average about eight to ten, around eight to ten feet apart. I mean, as you, you travel up uh, higher into the hills and things like that, they actually squash together. But on average, eight to ten feet apart. But they, because electricity will want to travel through the, the most conductive material, um, if anything is, is, is creating resistance, it's faster for the electric current to actually flow around it. Um, so I, this is how it first started, was me literally placing a lump of granite on a line and watching the line, you can follow it with the dowsing rods and actually watching it flip over to one side, so it moved out the way. If you then carried on moving the rock and pushing the rock across, you would actually, the line would keep going around it. So you can actually stretch yeah. and elasticate We're the We're going lines. to see that in the next video, actually. I mean, it's, it's absolutely fascinating because what you did was explain something that a lot of people have been unable to explain to me for a long time. In other words, that there's no, that, that it takes the mystery out of the whole thing. And you're saying, here's a little pl practical demonstration of what this is about. And obviously, um, this, this technology has been around for thousands of years. We're looking at the stone circles that, that um, are all over the British Isles and, and the megalithic structures of the world and how they're interlinked. What do you think about that? Do you think there is some kind of um, worldwide energy grid? Uh, it, it's been well documented that there is a grid. Um, personally, with my research at the moment, when, when most, of, most of my research has been out in the fields, so it's been out in open spaces, okay? I'm, I'm not one of these people that does geopathic stress with houses where you get, you know, negative and positive energy lines crossing in houses. Um, I've found in the fields, the lines tend to run in one direction. I'm not personally picking up this grid formation in the fields itself. I think the grid formations will exist, but I think it's a man-made construct. We've placed that grid in, we've actually put it in there ourselves through our building, through our infrastructure over the last few hundred years. I think if we, if we removed all of the houses and all of the roads, took all of that sort of off the planet, it would revert back to this effectively a standard model of, of lines running. So I think that we've we've actually caused these grids to develop and we've caused it in, with the house of the geopathic stress so i think our our ancestors were dealing with a very very simple um a simple um, simple and purer kind of yeah yeah, energy, it, yeah. You, you had a big open space why was why, i'm interested in why stone sites why sacred sites were built in, in places they are well, if you rewind back a few thousand years ago most of the uk was covered in forest so these sites seem to be up on in the high moorlands where obviously there weren't the trees. So you could manipulate and use these lines you, because it's the only place you can get at them. When, you, when they go into woods, and I've doused this before where you have the lines running in, into the woods, and it's like they, they dissipate. Um, so you get lots of tiny little lines, but then they gather again and form themselves back together again on the other side of the wood and they carry on. So I think... That's why our ancient ancestors used these massive open spaces, because it enabled them to gather together as many lines as possible. Yeah. 
Plus, really interesting because you you know the tying in something that 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 there's been a mystery for so long into something very simple. I think is what we're trying to do today. Uh, and show people that this is a natural energy, and um, it's there that anyone can tap into it. And as far as dowsing goes, can you just tell us about that? Because there's no mystique about it, is there? Um, no, no. You um, dowsing, dowsing has been around for thousands of years. It's still, or it's still used. Uh, modern prospectors use it. Um, uh, water companies use it, um, and it's basically using a set of L-shaped rods. Uh, we are uh, based on water, we're 70% water. Uh, everything has a slight electrical charge to it and everything has a slight frequency. So if you're walking along with a pair of dowsing rods and you're, you're intent and you're, you're saying, well, I'm looking for water, the rods will pick up on the frequency of water. They'll pick up on that, that specific frequency. If you were looking for, say, gold, then the rods would, they would ignore the, where the lines crossed yeah. on the water. So our body's kind of, um, and our, our vibration and intent magnetises um, us to, to what we're looking for, um, attracts yeah. us to what we're looking for. And, and this, is, this is not um, some kind of conspiracy theory because it's still used by water companies today and, even, and, and all sorts of corporations, isn't it, Stephen? Yeah, it is. Yeah. It is. And it's, it's when you, I've, I've trained people how to douse, and when, they first, when you first start off with a pair of rods, um, if you're just walking along, you'll be picking up all kind of there's no, all kind of vari yeah. variations. It might be electromagnetic or water, or but when you actually specifically say I am looking for X, Y, or Z, then the rods will only cross on on that point. And you can do experiments with water. You can put a bucket of water in front of you, and then you can ask to see say a telluric current, and they, it won't cross over the bucket. Yeah. So there's ways of of training the rods. I mean the whole. I now know that I can pick up a response from, from a left to a right yeah. with my rods. Because as I showed in the video. As I showed yeah. in the video. These lines flow across the earth. Now, um, they, um, they move around. They're not static. They move, they change direction from night to day. So a line that's currently flowing from left to right, um, come sunset, will switch around and start flowing the other direction. So they, they flow opposite directions day to night. So at the moment, yeah, you have a line that's crossing. All right, you have the little gateway in the middle that we've made. All right, and then we're back to just normal line here. So along here, this is all just normal line. Now, this is box standard blue lias. Uh, this is just local rock from Somerset. It's nothing flash or nothing. Uh, it's just no, it's local rock to us. It's type of limestone. Okay, I've got a line in front of me. So as I move the dowsing rods forward, they cross, they cross. Move over this side, they cross. Okay, this line at the moment. It's flowing from right, flowing from right to left. Now I've got two copper pins. Put one in there, and this is effectively it's just going to ground out the line and make a little gate. Okay, watch. Okay, your line is here. All right, go to the other side. The line is here. And when you go across the middle, now nothing happens. Nothing happens. Now watch. I've showed you that the lines move around the rocks. Okay. So what we're going to do is literally I'm going to push the left-hand rock across the grass. I'm going to move the tape out the way as well in a moment. Move the tape out. Push the other side across. Now the line before basically ran up to the pins and got grounded out. Now because the lines um, basically they will move as you as you move the rocks. What we've now done is the line is now flowing back through. So if I go through the dowsing rods now, okay, you can see that the lines now move back over here. Okay. Now if I move the pins, I can bring the pins again across, which is where the line is now flowing. Move that one over a little bit more. And now when I go through, there's nothing there. There's nothing there. I take the pins out from there, and there's your line. Okay, now what I'd like to do, I'm going to put the pins back where they were originally, because you'll like this bit. So, now, at the moment, okay, you go through the gate, and there's your line over there. Okay, so what we're going to do, we're going to release the line. Remember, they are like bits of elastic, so we're going to release both sides. Okay, it's now, seems to, uh, not over there, lift up the pins, take the pins out, and all of a sudden the gateway in the middle 
and there's your line back. So what we've done, the rocks, basically you can move the lines around things. Same Hold side. that thought, Steve. We'll be back after the break. This is Windows on the World on Telluric Energy and the Wisdom of the Ancients on a Sunday morning. We'll see you after the break. Welcome back to Windows on the World this Sunday morning. We're talking about ancient technology. We have some here. Um, please phone in. It's 0203 714 2700. We want to hear from you. Our next guest is Mark Bennett. He is a respected investigative journalist and photographer covering the fringes of culture and science and contributing features to many publications including Fortean Times, Skin 2 magazine and D as well as editing his own avant-garde cyber culture magazine Black Ice. He has piloted series for both BBC and Channel 4 along with acting as a consultant and camera expert for multiple programmes. He also has knowledge of free energy and ancient technology. Mark, welcome to the show. Hey. Hey. So you got in from Brighton, okay? Yep. It was sunny back then, but now it's dark. Yeah, that could be something to do with the geoengineering, eh? But that's, that's another show. That's another show. <laughs> that's another show. So tell us a bit about yourself, Mark. You've, you've, um, you seem to have vast knowledge of many things, including um, ancient technology and ley lines, organite. Yeah. Well, I think it's I fundamentally, at the end of the day, I'm a practical person, and I want yeah. things in my hands that I can test, hold, and use. Yeah. Um, so, for example, the organite, uh, a box was mailed to me by a friend up in uh, Hereford who makes them. He actually made this one. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I read the stuff on the internet, and it was like mad. It's like, oh, you put it in the ground, and it creates giant vegetables. And uh, <laughs> okay. just, just mad stuff. So I said, well, I don't have a garden, but I'll give it to my neighbor. He has a yeah. garden. Yeah. And uh, had to wait till it grew, and uh, came down. And popped over, and they said, uh, "Okay, well, what's what about did the organite produce any results?" So I said, "Oh, there's there's an improvement." So, oh, okay, that's good. Uh, where are they? Oh, they're downstairs. The wife's going to pickle them. Okay, so I get down the stairs, and he was being um, conservative in his comments. The uh, the size of a beet had gone from being that size to the size yeah. of American softballs, yeah. and so on. Um, you wrote some articles on this, didn't you? Yeah, featured for 40 yeah. times, which then appeared in yeah. GHQ, GQ, um, India, for all places, yeah. and the American toy tabloid, The Sun. Yeah, well, just bringing Stephen back in here, because um, your, your, um, your research probably crosses over in quite a number of areas. What do you think about Organite, Stephen? Have you ever used it? Um, I haven't personally used it, but I... I do think that our ancestors knew about it. Yeah. When they've um, excavated places like Silbury Hill, it appears they've been built up in the same um, inorganic, organic layers that organoid uses. Yeah. And again, um, you can actually um, you can actually do the same with dissimilar metals, yeah. and it can lower the the resistance. Of, well, of organite's kind of through. aluminium crystals and resin, though, isn't it? This this modern day organite. Yeah, it's basically. It's just, I call it a macro circuit. Yeah. So basically, it's a like you a circuit uh, circuit component that you'd have in your computer just yeah. made really large to affect the yeah. environment around it. Yeah. So just going back to the, what we were saying before the break, uh, Stephen, about just if you want to tidy that up, that bit about what you were talking about these concentric um, circles, um, and and your experiences of the energy. So maybe Mark could come in with that. Well, the, the point I was just reaching was the fact that um, it, it was interesting for me to actually find to see how these, uh, this energy had been manipulated, yeah. you know, and I could see exactly what, was, what had happened, but the fact that there was nothing happening in the circle, and then, again, I found out that the, the circle has been reconstructed, and so many yeah. of our ancient uh, Neolithic and prehistoric sites yeah. have been reconstructed. Stonehenge has been rebuilt three yeah. times, or they've all been put back together yeah. by, you know, well-meaning Victorian scientists, but the, the moment when you lift a rock off the ground, you, the line will actually ping out the way. So it's no wonder that so many of our stone sites, you, we've got no idea what our ancients were, were actually doing because, because yeah. basically we tried to put them back together again and, and all, all the actual, the charge effectively that you've put into it is dissipated. But that wouldn't affect um, things like the Kalanesh stones or Avebury, would it? Because those stones have always been there. Those stones have yeah. always been there, yeah. 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 So it's like putting together an Ikea 
kit without the plans and yes. they haven't figured out how to do it properly. Yeah. yeah. And it's just one little step at a time working out how they actually, I don't know why, this is the eternal question, why they actually did it, I haven't remotely got to that point yet, but the fact of how they actually managed to do it is, is what we're working towards now. There is a, we have a slight understanding of how they actually... But the dowser I worked with um, went to a property and he was dowsing energy line, bad energy lines because when they cross they create uh, harmful gamma radiation yeah. because of the frequencies and that will cause cl uh, cancer clusters in houses and so on. Yeah. In fact there's technology uh, which is mandatory in, uh, in Germany to install in uh, federal buildings to neutralize this and it basically hijacks your internal uh, power circuits, uh, lights and cables and so on and that turns that into a, a tuned circuits to neutralize these fields. Now the dowser normally puts down metal rods, as one does, and he discovered because this person, uh, Whale 2, uh, makes the organ organite, he had organite in the right places, and this dude right. did the same thing. So basically an artificial rock in some ways, Yeah. Uh, an artificial circuit to modify these energy lines. That's, yeah, that's very interesting, because we're, we're bringing in the work of this guy, William Reich, mm. yeah, which is organite, which is quite a recent thing really, isn't it? Yep, um, there's been some variations around. Uh, an original one would have been honey and uh, minerals, uh, rocks and quartz, so on. Um, so that's, that could be an, an ancient one. Yeah. Uh, a tree resin also has been used because it'll kind of, you want yeah. a bit of compression going yeah. on. Yeah. Um, there's a, the original inventor uh, in Germany whose name I've forgotten, sadly. And then Carol Croft came along and added the, uh, added the crystal in the middle of it. Yeah. And uh, that created an effect and uh, amplified the effect somewhat. Well, we're, all, we're talking really about kind of um, curing um, bad energy, but, but also manipulation of energy. And um, this, this ties in really with, with what this whole thing about the wisdom of the ancients is about. Mm. We, we, we get lots of documentaries telling us, uh, is it possible that or could it be? And th on a practical level, um, this, this manipulation or this use of Earth energy um, seems to be what was going on in all these ancient cultures. Would you agree with that? Sure, and there's a reason why. It's, yeah. um, it's interesting because it's a, to approach a lot of questions, you have to ask what they're not asking. Yeah. So in medicine, for example, what do they not ask? And, uh, and basically, they summed it up in the matrix. Yeah. Uh, we are copper top batteries, but we're not actual solid copper top batteries. We're yeah. wet cells. We yeah. are electrical beings. Yes. Uh, our brains are electric, our hearts are electric, blah, yeah. blah, blah. And if you started to look into the lost technologies and the suppressed technologies from the 1900s, Tesla included, you'll find out that, uh, hey, they can cure things with electricity. Yeah. Uh, so the bot basic either is voltage, some slight voltage yeah. and frequency based, yeah. or it's more complex and it's just high power yeah. voltage. That's, good. That's very, very interesting. This is Windows on the World, Sunday morning, 0203 714. 2700. We're now going to go to a video um, featuring Brian Forster talking about um, a possible ancient cataclysm which may have something to do with our loss of memory of who we are. What we're learning more and more, uh, and recently, is that the end of the uh, of the last ice age was not a gradual event, whereby the poles melted over the course of one or two thousand years. The more that uh, a multidisciplinary approach is looking at the end of the ice age, the more evidence there is that the poles had a massive melting, both north and south pole. Um, that may have only taken three years as the result of some kind of galactic event. It might have been an ejection of plasma from the sun. It might have been an ejection of energy from a galactic center. But it's, it's possible that the oceans of the world rose by 350 feet over the course of, of, of three years or less, and we can more or less pinpoint the date or timeline now to 9,700 BC or 11,700 years ago. And this is being backed up by such authors, again, as Dr. Robert Schock, who redated the age of the Sphinx, uh, Dr. Paul Laviolette, and others. Um, I think what we're looking at 11,700 years ago, plus or minus 
you know, a few hundred years is we're looking at the global flood, not only as spoken of in the Bible, but spoken of by at least, if not more than 200 different indigenous cultures all around the world. They all speak of this horrific event that happened that destroyed much, if not all, of their society as well as others. And that's where we enter the idea that uh, mythology actually is not mythology, that when people speak of this ancient event, they're speaking of real history that happened, but the problem we have is that we've been indoctrinated into this concept by most academics that civilization started 6,000 years ago or less, and that is our biggest stumbling block. Indeed it is, because we don't seem to go further back than Sumeria, or as they call it um, in, the, in the British Museum, Acadia. They do refer to that period as Acadian. Um, but yes, there's, there's no record of anything before that, and even that particular period of 6,000 years ago is very fragmented in the way it's um, presented to the public, isn't it? Oh, definitely. Um, you know, there is some... Obviously, Sumeria did exist beginning at that time. The Indus Valley was developing around that time. China was developing around that time. Egypt, more or less, was developing around 5,000 years ago. But again, the confusion is that um, many of these academics are so fixed in their concept that we went from hunter-gatherers to suddenly, you know, clustering and develop, developing agriculture. And then out of nowhere, you have the Giza pyramids being built, which today would not be impossible to build, but they would be an incredible engineering achievement. And yet we're saying that um, over the course of a few hundred or maybe a thousand years, people went from hunter-gatherers to building something uh, 500 feet tall, employing 2.3 million megaton blocks and built with such precision that, again, you can't fit a piece of paper in between these blocks. It's just, at this point, you know, this whole idea is becoming so ridiculous that I'm glad that there are many of us looking farther back in time and, and engaging with engineers and other experts in different fields to look at this from a multidisciplinary approach. Absolutely, and that's something, uh, the whole area of this, we're going to be looking at in the forthcoming weeks on Windows on the World with, with you, Brian. I hope you're going to become a regular contributor because we have so much to talk about, but thanks for today. And um, is there anything you'd like to say? Have you got a book out at the moment? Uh, actually, my latest book is um, is about the Nazca Lines because, again, they have been thought of as either being the constructions of primitive people or that aliens did them. And so I actually go through all of the all of the major and minor theories as to how they were made, who made them, uh, why and when. And uh, that book, as well as my other 12 books, can be found at uh, Amazon.com. Uh, I have more than 680 videos on YouTube under my name. And also uh, the latest and probably best of my videos are located at www.hiddenincavideos.com. You also do tours, don't you, Brian? Yes, my wife and I do tours. Uh, we do basically three major tours of Peru per year, one with uh, the, the company in the UK called Megalithomania. We also do one tour per year of uh, Egypt. Uh, we're going back at the end of March because the evidence of lost ancient technology in Egypt is far more profound and actually far more obvious than it is in Peru. We see lots of evidence of giant saw marks, uh, you know, high-speed drill activity, etc., that could not have been in existence uh, during the Bronze Age times of the Pharaonic Egyptians. And then we also do minor tours with two, three, or up to six and maybe ten people sporadically, but we don't have it, uh, the tours are not full-time because I have to be in the field as much as possible, to learn as much as possible, to be able to share with you and your audience and the world as much as possible. That's great. Well, thanks, Brian, for being on Windows on the World and look forward to speaking to you very soon. My pleasure. Thank you. Okay, that was Brian Forster, a great researcher, and he's been looking at the elongated skulls of Peru and the anomalous architecture, which is pre-Incan. 
We're going to discuss now whether there is a collective amnesia which has made us forget about this ancient technology and maybe we're just rediscovering it. What do you think about that, Stephen? Uh, yeah, I think there was. I think the, the... I hate to bring religion into it, but I think the church suppressed a lot of it um, going back over the years. I yeah. think religion is, is... You've lost the natural, uh, the natural way of actually... Of, of being with our planet. I think it's confused people and shut things down. That's my personal view. We have a caller, Josephine. Josephine from France. Are you there? I am. Hello there. Hello, Josephine. I'll just turn the monitor up so the guests can hear it. So, uh, welcome to Windows on the World. Thanks. So, what have you got to say to us today? Well, I find, um, I'm finding it all really interesting, and especially about how um, churches were built on ancient um, sites uh, you know, the gods of the uh, energy, etc. You know these sacred sites, and um, that for sure we can't really explain um, uh, exactly what their their functions were. But uh, it's it's really fascinating. And um, as regards to the ley lines, I have a, a memory of some family friends that um, found out their house was built on ley lines, and there was paranormal paranormal activity, and that they had to kind of ghosts and. Poltergeist, etc. And I was wondering if your guests had ever looked at that that link with the yes. energy, yes, yes, uh, you know, the negative energies and paranormal yeah. activity. That's very interesting, Josephine. Yeah, we'll bring that up now with, with Mark because he's itching to get going on that one, aren't you? Yeah, during our research, um, we were trying to track down something called um, Adam Site from Mid Wales. Now, this guy was a, a researcher on Con a builder, an engineer on Concord, who found a mineral in the Modris estuary of Wales. Put wires into it and get voltage out. So basically, a free energy rock of yeah. some sort. Yeah. And uh, when turning around that area, I was asking questions about okay, are odd phenomena in, in Wales in the mountains, the Cadres Idris, and so on. And people were saying, yeah, the people, a friend of ours built a house and they hadn't connected their uh, electrical grid yet, and all the lights were on. Yeah. And phenomena, and there's a lot of UFO phenomena around the area as well. So the ambient energies were palatable and usable yeah. in some way. Yeah. So it gets into uh, the other aspects of uh, how to harness the energies. Uh, we yeah. just don't have the tools to use it. Or we're using the wrong model. Yeah. So these things become very predictable if you know what system they're operating in yeah. under. And if you don't know yeah. how it's working, it's magic. Ooh, it's woo-woo. No, it's yeah. not. You're just not looking well yeah. enough. That's right. That's right. It, it's just this. It's just this um, harnessing of, of energy, really. And um, I think that's a very important point, Josephine, that you've brought up there. Have you got anything else to say to us today? Are you still there? Yeah. Um, and it also reminds me of the, the pyramids in Egypt because um, you know they, they 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 had these um, Because there is this theory, and I, I, I believe that there is something in this theory, that the, that the pyramids are p part of some energy grid. Um, the, 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 I've, my research has taken me into that direction. For instance, um, when uh, Siemens, the electrical guy, um, went up there at the turn of the century, went with a guide, and he had a wine bottle with, um, with um, paper wrapped around it. And they did some kind of experiment, and his guide got knocked off the top of the Great Pyramid because of the shock. But it appears that the, um, that the limestone, which is all degraded, um, when it was wet, was an incredible conductor. Have you got any ideas on that, Mark? Sure. Uh, it's also why you have all your copper piping and electrical yeah. supplies in your house and your radiators, radiators grounded. Because there's an electrostatic charge differential between floor level and top of a hill. Absolutely. So... Um, Re-listen to um, Salisbury Hill by uh, Peter Gabriel, yeah. and you'll you'll see it in a different light because it sounds like a an organ energy discharge that induced a out of body experience, uh, visions, and who knows what else. And keep in mind, you don't have to go on top of the hill for this. You can yeah. actually make shape patterns that will have the same effect. Yes, out of body experiences is something I've studied quite deeply, and. Um, 
Yeah, we're, we're basically talking about we are we are um, you know we're biological um, receivers and transmitters basically. Sure. So it's it's how we harness and channel this energy, and and the idea that we've lost a lot of this. I mean, with with modern living and the programming that we that we've undergone, basically. Well, it's corporate so, branding. Yeah. Via religion. Very good. Yeah. Via religion, really. Basically, yeah. we're saying, well, you have to buy this one, this one, this one, yeah. or that one. Oh, and ours comes with a uh, free bloody crown cross, um, yeah. and this one comes with a big fat guy. Correct. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Actually, if you look at the big fat guy in a certain way, and you know what the Mandelbrot set looks like, you'll go, holy crap, who does the Mandelbrot set? Yeah, that's, hold that thought. It's, uh, it's 0203 714 2700. 0203 714 2700. This is Windows on the World with my very special guests today, Mark Bennett and Stephen Doros. So, Stephen, bringing you back into the conversation here, um, as far as the d timelines and dating goes, there seems to be this idea that between 10 and 11,000 years ago, there was this huge catastrophe that wiped out a lot of the knowledge and also the memory of, of, um, of, of previous civilization. What do you think about that? Uh, there seem to be... Uh, Little tiny indicators dotted throughout the world, especially yeah. especially with the stonework. Yeah. Um, with the polygonal stonework we saw in Brian's video, there's uh, you can find traces of that in very early stonework of Egypt. Yeah. Like it almost looks like pre-pyramid yeah. stonework. Um, South Africa, Japan, yeah. um, they've all got a virtually identical way mm. of putting the actual rocks yeah. together. The the common held thesis with those rocks is the, the reason they were designed like that is to make, actually make them earthquake proof which infers a, a very a long-standing um, you know they're there for thousands and thousands of years um, so there is evidence of an ancient culture but there is also uh, a massive amount in, in virtually all religions um, the, the, there is a great flood of some description um, over 250 different religions I watched a video a few days ago about it of all got a flood myth in there somewhere, as though yeah. there was a giant cataclysm of some sort. There was uh, there was an earlier one when Santorini blew up, which was three thousand years ago, three thousand yeah. BC, something. Yeah, they go three thousand then. Um, yeah, but then there was this, 9, this, the big one, nine, which yeah. is the. But there's also yeah. there is um, scientists out in Japan have, have found evidence of a massive um, a gamma ray burst, yeah. effectively, well, from the sun, yeah. uh, which hit us around about the same time. So that again might be some some somehow ties it in. So, so we're rediscovering ancient lost technology to some degree. Do you agree with that, Mark? Sure, um, but if we're not allowed to look at electromedicine, because it's a, a, a subject that they don't talk about, even though they check your heart and whether you're alive or not with EKG and EEG, yeah. um, but have a Google for uh, the Cali patent from Einstein Med College of Medicine. Uh, 19 so, sorry, run that by me again. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, researchers of the Einstein College of Medicine, right. uh, Mr. Kelly and uh, et al., uh, discovered that if you put uh, 200 microampures across blood, yeah. it disinfects. Yeah. And 200 microampures isn't Cle much. Cleaning blood is something we're going to um, talk about, isn't it? Well, it also, keep, in, keep in yeah. mind this basically, yeah. uh, the systems they developed reversed HIV and uh, does a, a treat on other diseases. Yeah. And. Um, you can build one yourself now, or if you want to, to get one off the shelf, here's one from... Okay. There's not much to it. It runs on a We're going to be battery. back after the break Thanks. with Mark talking about this amazing contraption. This is Windows on the World. We'll see you after the break. Welcome back to Windows on the World this Sunday morning, 0203 714 2700. Please phone in, that's 0203 714 2700. Here is a video shot at the Chemtrails Awareness Day. This video features organite, which we've talked about, which is a mixture of resin, aluminium shavings and crystal. The feature technology containing this is known as a chembuster. We're also going to talk about chembusters uh, next week. It is, it's believed to affect and neutralise chemtrails. 
I'm here with uh, Betsy and Philippe, and Philippe has a contraption called a chem buster. Can you tell us how that works, Philippe? Okay, I try in easy words how it works. So actually what they spray in our air is uh, aluminium barrels and a couple of other metals. So uh, if these metals cannot attach to the oxygen what's in the air, they will go pressed up in space. And that happens when we have this positive loaded, I would say, ions. What's not really what it is, it's more a soft electron. So if we can clean the sky and make the ionosphere loaded, it with uh, minus load, it doesn't happen. That's the basic uh, idea behind this. It's resin metals. Yeah. You see coconut. resin. Yes. Yeah. Resin. Layers. Yeah. You you have crystals in. Yeah. Inside. Wait. Right. We show you also. It's a copper coil, and you have a crystal. There are uh, rock crystals, yeah. and the the top is the plus pole, and the down is the minus pole. Okay. So that gives the energy direction. So what happens in the tube is the vacuum, and that's what draws it. Yeah. It's essentially a free energy device. Yeah. These are good for dispersing sort of electromagnetic stuff as well aren't they really uh, yes of they, course that's what organs for so yeah, so why we make the pendants which yeah. kind of gives you a bit of a yeah. almost like a, a field around yeah. you as well yeah. so they disperse radiation basically certainly okay yeah, yeah, yeah. so so it, how could you, how could people make these or could have you got a website to go to where, where they can website, buy one and we're also looking to put together a, uh, a workshop a chembuster workshop to be able to explain the technology behind it because uh, Philippe takes not only the works of Reich but also the works of people like Lakovsky his coil and also a uh, Schauberger, the understanding of water, how we're built up to be able to create a system which is has an immediate effect and also will not have any negative effect on us, unlike a, well, the another um, Don Craft Don built Craft a system is the one which who is created this one of resin. That's not right, actually. So that's Don Craft system. This an American, one. An American, but we modified uh, this yeah. system because uh, his original system has six pipes, and these copper tubes are really expensive. If you have to buy six of these pipes, you already pay. Hundred twenty oh. pounds uh, yeah. alone. Yeah. So uh, if you have one tube, it's easier to afford it for everybody. So what effect would that have on a chemtrail? <laughs> so you can, uh, well, you can change the weather with something like this. And you, they, they don't happen actually. So are you saying it ne neutralizes the, the the metallic particles? Is that what it does? So the, the negative so going. So he was when he said the minus signs. He's yeah. talking about the negative ion. Chemtrails get sprayed in first place to uh, act on the ionosphere. That's the sphere of ions in a height of 10,000 meters above our head. Uh, so that, there you have streams, what we talk about the earth grid. And if these streams are blocked, it's like a canal. What's blocked, uh, the weather cannot flow properly anymore. So if it, if there are enough minus ions, the, the particles can't fall down and they will get pushed into space, actually, because they are so fine. Uh, they, uh, and the worst is not just the particles, but the more. This could be like a kind of reverse harp. Uh, yes, actually, yes. If, if you have the ionosphere working, the harp doesn't work. So yeah? just to give you an example, because um, this one, you know, we have a three-meter tube, which is yeah. which gets attached yeah. to this, which yeah. you figured is okay. easier to drive down without such yeah. a thing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but we had for a uh, couple of months, um, it, it was only like this, and we were quite impressed to see the effect that it still had and what it dissolved in the air. Because Philippe has been working with these for a number of years and has been studying the sky and, had, you know, putting in the direction of the wind and understanding what it does and how to uh, differentiate the flows. But when we put the tube in, within two days we had, the, it was the other week, those, those two days of those lightning storms. And then within a week we had that massive storm that came in. And I'm not saying that, trying to take credit for this massive thing, but it's very interesting how with this one and also a friend that we work with up in Hartlepool, up in, uh, in Yorkshire, who's got a much, much bigger one that we built with them and so if you look at the radar you see London and up there in Middlesbrough you actually see how the weather how the clouds go in and then and it disperses over London and up here so we've already we can see a noticeable effect from and it, and it, it's, I, I, it's I'm new so it's not just the government changing the weather it's you two as well it's, it's, it's a bit of a well no we, we we say we help nature to help herself
you know, you can take some various methods to clean out the particles from your body that you so you're not as much of a receptor to the the harp and all these other fun things that they love to, to mess with us with and uh, and and you know and and um, uh, with with simple devices that one can build with guidance it's and just a little bit of maintenance as far as moving the um, uh, you have to move the location every few days uh, yeah yeah it depends really on the situation I mean if you have time I would suggest every four hours a part the time you sleep of course um, what's interesting to know is as longer the tube as bigger the vacuum and as quicker that flows the whole thing of course as more you have here as bigger this thing is as more it can transform so you bury this or you just no 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 you can down. just put it yeah. on the ground you put it on the ground yeah there's no real need some people bury it but yeah. the thing is then you make hundreds of holes in your <laughs> soil <laughs> no, because you ruin the lawn couldn't position it yeah. Well, it, yeah because you have to keep yeah. moving because you know you put it in the soil that does have an effect but then if it stays there too long and then it goes stagnant yeah. so then everything yes. just so yeah but uh, yes uh, we, it's we a look... bit like acupuncture for the sky so <laughs> um, what's important and when it works the best is when you pose it against the wind stream because the organ energy flows against the wind it's uh, the organ energy is highly uh, magnetic to the oxygen the oxygen we all know is highly magnetic so and uh, this energy is also highly magnetic if we read the books of Reich that's what we find out so it flows against the wind so if you place it against the wind you have the quickest flow and best reaction but uh, you really need to observe the sky for longer to really see the differences but you see the differences instantly as you place out the jam buster normally the first reaction you get is a black helicopter why don't you tell Mark what, uh, you, how you and your team worked in uh, Luxembourg and what you did to the radiation levels of the country, which uh, the country takes credit for now, but... Yeah, well, <laughs> um, I actually come from Luxembourg, of course. So uh, we worked there and we placed uh, campuses over the whole country. What's not hard? <laughs> Luxembourg big. is quite small, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, so, but still we had like uh, 10 campuses over the whole country, so we have the radiation level to zero down now because organ is the natural counter energy of of um, radiation so uh, we had quite impressive results also there uh, people just don't notice it because they don't look in the sky or they don't have the time actually if you see the cloud seeding nobody who doesn't look a half an hour in the sky can see how these clouds appear slowly uh, so the templates are obvious but then they get told it's contrary but scientifically complete and big nonsense uh, I mean there's no backup for all this uh, so so the criminality went down, um, and there's some very yes. Various uh, other that's another effect of organ energy is that really the people get softer. We believe in Betsy for, for the People's, people's Voice TV. TV. <laughs> the People's Voice will continue to cover the chemtrails phenomenon and all issues connected with it. We will be talking more about William Reich, Schauberger, Bob Beck Zappa and Organite and of course ancient technology. With the corporatisation of the music business and less and less outlets for original talent, our next guest continues to perform and push the boundaries. She refers to herself as the Last Chanteuse. She's Anne Pigalle. The Last Chanteuse came all the way from Paris to London to tell the tale. She grew up with punk, recorded with Trevor Horn and Michael Nyman, worked on a film project in America with Donald Kamel, has had exhibitions in London and has been very influential on the art pop world for the last 10 years. After her latest self-release, Madam Sex, she decided to make a new album. She has created a fundraiser on Sponsum ending on the 23rd of December and she needs your support. She hates the world of generic and stolen ideas and with this new album she wants to put up a fight for identity and show that someone still cares. Anne Pigal, welcome to Windows on the World. Bonjour Mark. Bonjour, the last chanteurs. So, Anne, you were at a very strange gig last night, weren't you? Uh, yeah, but I don't know if I'm supposed to talk about that. Well, uh, it's Sunday morning, yes. Yeah. It was very interesting. It was a kind of tri tribal, uh, queer, um, a, a ritual which is supposed to mix uh, 
Sexual. Right, that's enough of that. We're not having anything like that on Windows on the World. Sexual and spiritual <laughs> energy. Oh, that's all right then. Together, yeah. you know. Yeah. Which is uh, which is really <laughs> seems to be the problem of, of the world. You know, everybody yes. is like everybody seems to be in a straight jacket. You know, especially mm. the, the people are at the top and yeah. and they feel so bad that they mm. they have mm. to try to control things. Mm. You know, so us are artists. The role mm. is to to make them feel a, a, a little bit better. That's why I titled this album um, uh, Madame Sex because. Yeah not being a, a young chicken anymore, you know, I think I, I kind of know a couple of things and, and I think there's still a stigmatization about, about sex, you know, yeah, in yeah. this country yeah. and, and so I think I can bring a, a little bit of, 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 of help in, in this kind of difficult uh, times where yeah. everything's, you know, uh, I mean, if, if money is tight, it means that people are going to get tight too. Yeah. And, and the problem is that people are, are kind of tight, you know, yeah. and so they want to make the, uh, the money scarce, you know. And the problem really starts there, you know, yeah. if people don't feel good with, with themselves, they yeah. want yeah. everybody else to, to feel bad, you know. So for me, the problem starts with a, a personal, you know, yeah. understanding yeah. of of oneself and, and the sexual element, you know, when I did with when I did with sex, it's not really sex. I I, I did with the rapport between yes. uh, a people. Yes. You know, because sex is. is That's because you're a French chanteuse. We are going to go to our bit, first yeah, okay. um, uh, so our next caller, <laughs> okay. not our first caller. Okay. okay. <laughs> Anne. Next caller. Hold back. Okay. Hold back just a bit. Okay. Thank you. Our next caller is Joe. Hi. Hi, Joe. Hi, uh, great show, fantastic stuff. Um, this, um, I don't know if I'm taking you away from the subject you're on, but um, could somebody explain how to make organ art? Um, it's, um, it's amazing stuff. And, uh... Yeah. Oh, it's, it's okay, well, we'll just go quickly to, over to Mark here. Yeah, it's, there's uh, tutorials on YouTube. Basically, you start with a muffin tin and you buy some resin, which is pretty easy to use. It's two ingredients, mix them together with waste metal shavings, you can get it from, from a machine shop, free, and a quartz pebble or a crystal pebble or a, something even more elaborate like a amethyst or some other rock, but you can use them and the most basic ugly ones, uh, which you use in the garden, you bury them, the one on the, uh, the extreme right. Uh, there are prettier ones which are getting towards you, um, so they don't have to be pretty to be functional. Yeah, yeah I've got some of these ones at home. These ones here. Well, there's an artist here by the name of Martin Sexton who's using them in, yeah. in his ex ex exhibition yeah. recently. Oh, him? Yeah. Yes, yeah, my fault. So, do you place these up? So, sorry, do you yeah, place what's that? around the house? Do you place them around the house? Uh, yeah, I, I have them around the house. Uh, my back garden just grew massively because of it. The trees are now kind of growing and touching together where they weren't before. Um, another bizarre phenomena, and again, this relates to the ancient sites. Now, we, I did a lecture up at the Liverpool Biennale spin-off uh, lecture series, and we sent a box to the uh, organization's office, and people were taking them, and maybe there's a, a good box, so we didn't mind, and they had them as paperweights on the desk, but the women were taking them and sitting with them on their laps, and it made no sense whatsoever. Yeah. I mean, you have to get up and down a few times during the day, so you have to pick it up. Get up. Yeah, yeah. So, like, why? I mean, it didn't make any sense. But I was reading some ancient site, uh, stories, and apparently this is some stones that women go to and sit upon to become more fertile. Have you ever heard of this, Sam? Um, it's very interesting. You should tell me more about it. Right. <laughs> Maybe you could put this into your act. You see. Yeah. Organite. Well, Kate Bush has. <laughs> exactly. Was that was that the Cloudbusters video? Cloudbusters. Yeah. That's right. Do you remember that, Anne? No. No. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I think it had um, Donald Sutherland in, didn't it? Yes, yes. yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so, so Anne, um, you've been performing for quite a, well, quite a number of years, haven't you? You started off in the 80s, didn't you? Yeah, I started up in the 70s. I grew up with punk, you know, and, and to me, that demonstrated that eight people could change the, the world. If, even, you know, if now that has died down a bit, I mean, yeah. it, you know, it's in museums, so... So obviously it died down, uh, you know, so something else needs to happen to kind of w wake people up a, 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 a bit. You know, if eight people I think something that it, needs to yeah. happen now to wake people up. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, as far as performance goes, I mean, we, we, you're, you're still doing this kind of do-it-yourself. This is why I invite yeah, you on I, the show. I, I really like what you do. They're, they're yeah. never going to make me shut up. That's never going to happen. <laughs> I've never been able to make you shut up. That's for sure. But you like my, my conversation. I do like your conversation. It's, you know. Uh, it's just the, the way it is, you know, I mean, uh, business record companies, they, they know about business, but they have the feeling that they know about uh, music too. Well, yes. no, 
Mm. Musicians are the one who, who create that. They're the one who create a, a music, and they're the one that that should do it. You know, today in the corporate world, they choose a, a puppet, and they pay a hundred people to actually steal yes. ideas from. Yes. Uh, uh, um, uh, musicians, you know, and, and creative people, and they stick them on, on their pu puppet, and it only works for people that really want to swallow stu stupidity. But in reality, yes. it doesn't make people fe feel good, you know, it just makes people buy something. Correct. And, 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 and music is a spiritual thing, you know, so they should make money with music, not money with money. And so I'm a, a musician. My, my father was a jazz um, a musician, you know, like uh, uh, Django Reinhardt things. So I actually like music. You're keeping the tradition <laughs> alive. So <laughs> we've got ancient technology, you know, uh, the corporatization of the music business. This is Windows on the World. We've got a bit of time left. 0203 714 Sorry? Then I have to sing. You have to sing. Give us two lines. Come on. Okay, this little poem song from Madame Sakis called Over the Top, and it goes like that. Dressed up in kimono and a whip in my hand, didn't you say you liked it when it hurts a little? And the air is the one you've learned to appreciate, and the touch is the one you've learned to recognize. Over the top, darling, please give it to me. Slow down to rush and hurry to linger. I cannot anymore contain all my anger. Show us the energy. Give me the ecstasy. That's a kind of um, very sort of risque. No, that's, vibe, isn't it? <laughs> that's the, the most mild poem of the anti Madame Sex uh, CD. You know, I paint each little cover individually. Yeah. You know, it's just all done by, by me. The music, the packaging, and this is your, your cr Christmas gift, Mark. This well, thank you, Anne. Thank Christmas. you very much. And any, anybody who res respects themselves should get one because they learned a little bit more. Not about pornography. I, I, I do make a difference. We understand that, you know, Anne. Okay. You're allowed to lie around half naked smoking because you're French. <laughs> yes. Th Madame th Sex. And hand painted by Anne Pigal. Yes. Available from ampical.com. Yes, and also it's part of the re rewards for the fundraiser. You know, uh, mo most of the things. It's Just all things. Just quickly wrap up with that, Anne, about I, the fundraiser. Yeah, I so, do myself. Well, you know, I, I'm going to do it myself. I've already recorded this album with a big name uh, producer, and yeah. just because they have a big name, they, they think they kind of know it all. Well, no, I'm, I'm sorry. You know, I grew up with, with, with music. It's yes. my blood. You know, I, I, I know what I'm supposed to sing. And so as we know, video killed the radio star. <laughs> oh, don't we know? <laughs> <laughs> so, well, we're going to get on to this now because um, we're, um, we're, uh, we're going to talk about Bob Beck Zapper because Mark got his zapper out just before that break, didn't you, Mark? Just I to did. lower the tone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, I did. Uh, I was on a TV course called um, Documentary Filmmaking, and uh, I came up with this idea for a, a show documentary called. Um, uh, Mistress Black and her Violet Ray. And interestingly, the Violet Ray device is uh, currently on Vogue in the S&M community right. uh, because it hurts a bit. To tie but, in nicely. With yeah, the, yeah, to tie in nicely. And, thing, and basically yeah. what it is is the Tesla coil inside, yeah. designed by Nikola Tesla with noble gases inside, which glow purple. Now what you get off this glowing purple thing is uh, negative ions, RF radiation, deep thermal heating, you name it, there's a whole slew of electrotherapies in there. Now, these things were kind of written off after, oh well, in the 1930s and before, during World War II. But you can still find them at car boot sales and on eBay, good old eBay. And, um, and certain dominatrixes are still using them. And whether they're actually curing people of their various afflictions, uh, we don't know. But there are a number of glass attachments for it for every orifice known to the man. Well, maybe you can swap details with that after the show. So we're, we're, we're talking about organites, and um, what we yeah we're going to go to a break in a little while. But just to sum up, um, those people were using um, organite and a thing called a Ken Buster. Have you ever come across this before? Yeah, I know someone who has one. Yeah, I've got one in my back garden. Someone gave me. Yeah. Well, can you just explain quickly how it works? Well, it's basically like an organ. It's basically an organ generator with with tubes on. Uh, yeah. Same basic functionality, but. Yeah. Uh, more focused and uh, more directional. So it's basically pollution is positively ion yeah. based. There's That's a lot great. Mark, hold that thought. We're going to go to a break. This is Windows on the World, Sunday morning. We'll see you after the break.
Welcome back to Windows on the World on Sunday morning, 0203 714 2700. 0203 714 2700. Please phone in and join us. We have the Chanteurs, Anne Pigal, with her hand painted latest CD. The latest have, Chanteurs. That's correct. Yeah. We have Mark Bennett, um, a researcher, and Stephen Doros. Another researcher, amongst other things, guys, you know, I'm, I'm just trying to keep it simple in this last section of the show. We were talking about the telluric energy currents to start with and the way that rocks can take this energy. Um, Stephen, could you just kind of pick up on that again? Um, it, it, as, well as, the, as well as being able to, to, to move the lines around, um, because the, the rocks have a... a, a Toroidal energetic flow actually in them themselves, which is the, the same as certain types of organite. You can actually design organite to create those as well. So that there was experiments done, and I've only just started looking into this by a chap called Thomas Townsend Brown, who's um, passed away now, unfortunately. But he started to he he was the first guy to actually realise that all rocks have electrical potential. So you, you can put a couple of, uh, of um, electrical uh, circuits onto a rock and you can actually measure there will actually be an energy uh, a flow of electricity through the rock it's not connected to any batteries or anything so it is a flow of energy through the rock other dowsers have gone out of sacred sites and they've found rings of energy going up and down rocks so it appears somehow there is a way to connect the telluric currents with the rocks with the, the cosmic alignments of, of the stars and how because from what I believe with all going as well, you can, you, if you create it on certain days when, say, it's a full moon, you can actually create it, you can change, you can make exactly the same piece of organite each day, but it will, the strength will change depending on when you've made it. So it's it, tying everything in together is the next stages. Everybody's so got a little bit. Yeah, that's the, uh, it dovetails quite nicely by Andrew Collins's research in the uh, Circle Makers, which I'll put up the page I'm fascinated with, which I want to do the experiment again. The, uh, the maze, uh, famous maze at Chartres Cathedral, which you'll probably know about, uh, is a, a labyrinth of sorts. Yeah. And uh, he had, uh, through, I think, psychic means, came up with a diagram. Now, I'll hold it still at the right camera yeah. and zoom into that. Now, you've probably seen something very similar to this in ancient sites, but also somewhere, something more recently. In the back of a book, uh, specifically in the back of a book, so you don't nick it, and you walk through the modern equivalent of Stonehenge, uh, and your alarm will go off if you are nicking it. So uh, the other thing, the fun thing about this is that when he got this thing pattern working, um, it blew out all the circuits in the house when he started playing music. So maybe Stonehenge is like just the the infrastructure. And you need to have music in it, or some sort of. How about a priest's, uh, a bishop's mitre? You know the circle coil with the crystal in the middle. Well, this ca carries into something um, where they had the, the druids, for instance, um, Fingal's Cave, where they were meant to have these sort of eternal choirs. In other words, people singing 24 hours a day as a healing or spiritual um, event. You know, and it was it was going on all the time. So we know about sound waves, and we know what they can do. I mean. Uh, Michael Tellinger actually demonstrates there was a guy who's dead now, but he was um, he was boiling water with sound. Are you are you familiar with that, Mark? I recognise the name, but that's about it. Yeah, and Michael Tellinger's the um, the researcher. Yeah, he he researches sort of ancient technology. Yeah, in South sites. African. That's right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, as as far as organ goes, I mean, the, it originated with this guy William Reich. Um, can you yeah, just well, give it's, a bit? Yeah, well, it's chi. It's key. That's all these yeah. um, terms that come up and are different throughout yeah. history. Yeah. And he was able to manipulate it and package it. I mean, William Burroughs, who I've photographed, um, when I met him, he was ancient, and he had a, a grip like a Terminator. I mean, the guy was intensely yeah. strong yeah. and kept on going. Uh, so there are health benefits, and if you start looking at it in this slightly different way, yeah. which modern medicine is not even acknowledging, yeah. you go, wait a second. You're talking really about attuning yourself to, to, to natural energies, aren't you? Which, well, which is yeah. why grounding and so on works yes. for people. And there's devices yeah. that uh, function like grounding, um, yeah. organic enhanced uh, zappers and, and a yeah. whole range of things. Is there any way people can pr protect themselves against sort of electromagnetic frequencies? 
Yeah, there's this German device, uh, which is sold by dowsers that plugs into your house and turns your entire house and grounding system into a, yeah. a shield of one sort. But yeah. uh, people also use organite and there's other methodologies to it. Yeah. So as far as, say, say like Stonehenge, I mean, you've got these dolerite stones there. They, they, they to me, would be the conductors. Is that right, Stephen? Um, I, I actually think they were the capacitors. Yeah. I think the big, the big, um, the, the the sandstone, uh, the the big sandstone ring around it. I think was actually to, um, to um, to lock the energy yeah. in into the right place. But I think with the dolerite, because it's a very um, um, power electric magnetic rock, it will absorb yes. and take an electrical charge. It won't hold on to it like it like a battery would, but it will actually absorb it. Um, I think that's why they dragged all the, the dolerite all the way over there because it's because it's that particular type of rock. Yes, because obviously they, they, they took it hundreds of miles, didn't they? So yes. and it and came. Did they in fact drag it? They in fact dragged it. No, did they drag it? That's a very interesting point which exactly. ties into what Stephen's talking about. Did they drag it along the ground? If it was dragged along the ground, it would have pulled these lines with it. Maybe yeah. that's why another reason it was chosen because it was as far west uh, of, that's on great. the coast. We've solved the secret of Stonehenge. Phew! <laughs> yeah, so, so Mark, what is it? Uh, yeah, so you're, you're looking at rocks and so on to manip manipulate uh, energy on the human body and or in space and so on. So my one thought for the day is crowns, useless hats. Maybe they're not designed to be pretty things on top of a queen's head, but actually a function of some sort, a psychic amplifier or a, a visual representation of uh, an energy that is visible to psychics, but not visible to the common man. Absolutely. I mean, they're, they're dual encrusted, aren't they? And mm. um, the idea that they're just for, ju that they're, they're, they're now for ceremonial purposes. Mm. So that goes right back as, as when, when ceremonial things were actually important. And well, they weren't just, um, b you know, BBC News, basically. Well, and you're, and, um, you're also waving looking, in carriages. The, the idea of a cargo cult is one that I play with a lot, having re-engineered the Ark of the Covenant. Um, is the idea that there was a technology at one point and what we have now is like a, a knockoff Chinese kind of Poundland version of it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it won't work. Yeah. Although if you hold your plastic toy cell phone to your hat, mm -hmm. people will think you're using a phone. Yeah. yeah. So it's the action. Yes. Um, so yeah, there's a whole slew of technologies like that. You're going, wait a second, what, what, what would happen if that actually did something? And the last one I picked up was a... Uh, Back on, um, is the Tibetan prayer wheel. Yeah. Now, they have to keep that going to keep the world going. Yeah. And you go, okay, why? Mm. And then you go, okay, how many people have spinning wheels around and what do spinning wheels do? Well, electromotors. You have one on your bicycle to get light. Yeah. And then you start working from there. And then you take the thing apart and you go, this actually looks like coiled metal kind of a structure of a, a what's called a of an electrical motor yeah. uh, almost identical to it although it's done in paper so obviously it's not going to work because it's made, made out of paper yeah. but the visual representation representation is the same so you're saying that represents something, something that a piece yeah. of technology it's a symbol basically. I, I basically pissed off a buddhist monk this way i said <laughs> he's spinning his little thing and he's saying uh, do you have one of those that work <laughs> and he got really upset. <coughs> I said, yeah, but I'm focusing intent. Yeah, I know, but you, if you turn, turn it on? I mean, the, Ark, the, the nice Templars in Scotland say, yeah, yeah we have three Ark, the Arcs of the Covenant. Yeah. Well, hey, when did you last turn them on? Yeah. And what did you use them for? Oh, no, they're sacred. Oh, you can't see them. Well, this is a very interesting thing as well about ancient technology. You wrote about the Ark of the Covenant, didn't mm. you? I've read something about it being this sort of very dangerous device that Yahweh carried around, killing sure. people, basically. Yeah, well, you, if you uh, were to take apart a uh, TV set, uh, the capacitors inside, uh, they're not quite small, mm. could knock you, to, uh, knock you to the floor at least yeah. and not even kill yeah. you. Yeah. Now, imagine one the size of a sofa. Yeah. Now, you put that inside of the Great Pyramid to charge it up, and you go, wait a second. But how That's did an the interesting pyramid thought. charge it up? How did they actually get the energy into the pyramid and what energy was used in the pyramid to actually charge it up in the first place? That's a good question. That's well, the interesting well, we're bit, missing is the how they we're made miss, We're that. missing the gold pit on the top, for starters. Yep. You have electrostatic potential differential between the ground floor and the top. Yep. Um, 
the Moray device is something else you want to Google. Yeah, um, yeah look to that. It has to do with uh, collecting atmospheric ionization and energy. Yep. Um, so given the size of the pyramid, and considering how flat the desert is, it would be very uh, a good point to start collecting that that charge f just from the uh, from the atmosphere. Yep. Yep. Well, it's very interesting because the, the also the, the capstone of the Great Pyramid is meant to be the meteorite, the Ben Ben Stone, and there's, there's this 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 great reverence for meteorites, isn't there? Yeah. Um, it, 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 going well, back it's to natural it. mineral. It's Absolutely, na yeah. Natural mineral, and it's basically natural iron. Yeah. Yeah. So again, you have to work with the energy that's a available to yeah. you naturally. Yeah. Um, I mean, think of organite as a form of windmill. Yeah. Uh, if it's the wind's not blowing, it's not going to do anything. Yeah, because Jacob's Pillow was again meant to be a, uh, made out of meteor meteorite rock, wasn't it? I, I it wasn't where. I think so, yeah. So it would, it would explain why these things are carried around, you know, not just as ob objects of reverence, but for some practical use. <coughs> well, back to the supernatural part, the best footage I've ever seen um, of ghosts was taken out of the haunted house on a dark and stormy night, which is the plot line to every horror story <laughs> that you have. Yeah. But they didn't say it was a dark and raining yeah. night. Yes. They said stormy night, so it yeah. hasn't actually peaked. Yeah. So take a voltmeter, put it yeah. on the outside of a building on a dark and stormy night, yeah. and you'll find the positive ion ratings just like off the roof. Yes. So keep in mind that you <coughs> put the Ark of the Covenant in your Holies of Holies, yeah. the tabernacle, it has a charged atmosphere. Well, it's very interesting because the, 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 um, a lot of this ties in with this, this um, time of the Shekinah, which is Venus and Mercury conjunct in the sky. And this was meant to have something to do with the, with the Ark of the Covenant and the placing of it at the time of this holy Shekinah, so it would shine on it. I mean, all this stuff, is it, all this astrological stuff ties in with the, with the, um, with the energetic side as well. So it, it's very interesting that you've got this kind of mainly people go, oh, Stonehenge, you know, the solstice. Yeah. But what about all year round? What's the point of just having it for a couple of days a year? There's no point, is there? This is what Brian Foster was saying about these um, megalithic sites in Peru on the top of mountains. You well, wouldn't carve up the whole top of a mountain just for an astrological well, alignment, I mean, would you? Look at the question of uh, why is Apollo and so on on top of a mountain? Why are the uh, mysterious Chinese uh, immortals mm. on top of mountains? Why is Ren Le Chateau? On yeah. top of a mountain. Yeah. Well, they all what, are. What's the yeah. indicator there? Yeah. The, the indicator there for me is the red soil, yeah. which is highly iron. Well, we'd love to go into the um, the mysteries of the Knights Templar on a future a future show, um, because that that's another very very interesting area, especially um, where the uh, Jacob's Pillow ended up, because that's alleged to have been in, obviously still in Scotland. A lot of people believe. And Scotland's a huge part of this with the, um, especially you've got the Hebrides and the Shetland Islands, which um, there is a theory that they were shattered by this comet about 3,000 years ago. And, and Britain was part of Atlantis. I mean, there's all these theories out there. The problem is we, we've got a lot of theories. I mean, the stuff we've been talking about today is quite practical. Um, we're talking about organite. We're talking about things that can realign you um, physically and mentally. And, and, and basically um, keep your awareness open. I think a lot of this is about um, keeping that natural awareness that we have, which is what dowsing's about. It's not about thinking, it's just about awareness, opening yourself up. So, yeah. the, uh, just to, to finish off, uh, yeah. the guy, Michael Persinger in Laurentian University was doing some very interesting ex experiments. He, had, he could generate telepathy on demand yeah. through electrical charges across yeah. the temporal load. Telepathy on demand. Now, if you were able to do induce yeah. that, um, because of where you are, yeah. which sacred spot you're on, yeah. that would be a major advantage. Yeah. Well, this is very interesting. It also goes into another thing we'll discuss on future shows: called binaural beats, mm. which um, which are two two frequencies that make a third pulse, which have an effect on the brain pattern. Lo-fi. Yeah. So anyone with a drum kit could do it. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Indeed, Mark. So, um, well, we've had a great um, debate today, and we've touched on quite a lot of subjects. We've um, we've tried to um, get, give a lot of information here, and we will be coming back to that. I'd just like to thank everybody who's been on the show, um, and Pigal. And do you just my, want to my last word. Is, you your know, last word? Yeah, I, I need the last word. And, you, know. you want the last word? Yeah, mu music is good for you, so don't take it out of the equation. We won't do that, Anne. No, you won't, but they're, they're doing it.
Yes, uh, that's very true. And that doesn't... Uh, that, that well, they're taking the real music out of the equation. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. there's no music. It's all yeah. image, yeah. you know, that there's no yeah. creation, you know, it's not... Music is spiritual, it makes you feel good. Yeah. That's how it came in the first place. That's part know. of the energy raising vibration yes, absolutely. of the ancients. I mean, mu music is very uh, th therapeutic, you know, in, in a lot of cases they actually use it, you know, absolutely. To, to, make, to, to heal yeah. people, you know. Yeah. And they've changed a lot in, in the way of, yeah. of, of records are, are made by yeah. the, the, this kind of people, you know. They, they change the, the way it's made, so, so it actually it doesn't make you feel good, you know. It's been. Uh, Absolutely. This is, this is one of the things that's happened, yeah, is you know. that music's got worse. So And, and they changed the yeah. beat, you know, and, and Absolutely. the way it's made. So we're it just going to, it's, it's going to Mark okay, now that, to that, finish that's up. That's it, I'm, I'm finished. Okay, yeah. all right, no, <laughs> this is Windows on the World. Uh, we'll see you next week. Thank you very much. My name's Mark Windows. See you next Sunday. Thanks to Anne, Mark and Stephen. Oh, 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 oh,